So the mother provided his last location, which was somewhere around Rishikesh, is what mm. he told them where the trek would be. And so after a few days of investigating, uh, the first sign of Spolan was found. And you know, you think that receiving a sign is a good thing. The parents would be excited, or you know, you finally There's something some indication. about my son's whereabouts. Yeah. And the sign was good. But it was probably the eeriest evidence that I think we've come across. Our next guests are Aishwarya and Aryan, the dynamic duo behind Desi Crime Podcast. Over the years, they've captured crime stories from across India and brought to light the most heinous deeds of humanity. Join us as they unravel the layers of their unusual profession, explore intriguing cases from across India, and delve into the darker side of human nature. It's going to be a spine-chilling conversation that will leave you on the edge of your seat. Welcome to the Humans of Bombay show, Aryan and Aishwarya. I love the fact that all three of us are barefoot. Let, let me just yes. start with I'm that. Show my <laughs> That's as Indian as it gets, getting barefoot. Yeah. So interesting. You'll have just graduated, right? Yeah. She's graduated. She's just graduated. And you'll have started this podcast uh, for a few years now. Three years. Yeah. yeah and um, such an interesting subject. So let's just start on that. Mm. How have you decided to pick this topic? Um, and I'll tell you why. Because even I get really into certain things like you know when when you when you find a particular case or a particular time in history go really deep but then you actually it starts playing on your mind um subconsciously it's at the back of your mind like i was uh, um writing on the 26 11 attack so for two three weeks before i i interviewed a large amount of people and i was watching like cctv footage and i was listening to audio clips and interviewing people and I found that I was like I used to also have dreams about it at one point. So I'm very interested to know how you'll have picked this topic, both of you. I think to me, this is the perfect coming together of my obsession with true crime since I was a child. And I think part of that comes from my mother, who's also deeply obsessed. Yeah, uh, I think it comes from that added to which is, I think, my my passion for oration and being a debater when I was younger. I think the coming together of those two things, the adrenaline that I think one is capable of getting from stories of other people without actually living through them yourself, mm -hmm. yet reading of those from other people's perspective and through other people's experience and lives, coming together with my love for oration and debating is what one day led to this podcast. Yeah, yeah it's a <laughs> funny story. So we went to the same college together which she graduated from. I didn't. I dropped out. I'll just make that very clear. <laughs> but uh, so Ashwara, she's a true crime juggernaut. She loves listening to true crime podcasts and consuming true crime in all its forms. Uh, yeah. And she used to insist that Aryan, you listen to this. Mm -hmm. And our full disclosure, I, I don't like true crime. Okay? <laughs> uh, I'm not a big true crime guy. And I especially wasn't before the podcast. And she used to tell me to listen to Crime Junkie. Mm -hmm. and junkies with her. Uh, and, um, you know, one fine day I just went you know, why do you listen to all these white true crime podcasts? There's a lot of crime happening back home. Um, why is like, why don't you listen to an Indian true crime podcast? Mm. And, you know, that split second where there was silence, we realized, oh, shoot, it's because there is no, no Indian yeah. true crime podcast. And I wish I had a romantic story for <laughs> how the podcast came to be, but it was a very supply demand kind of thing. But you went, people love listening to these stories told well. Mm. Um, and uh, I think we can fill that gap. We are good orators, we're good Absolutely. writers. Yeah. And there's, I think, there is something common to stories of South Asia and crime in South Asia, which is so unique to the rest of the world yeah. that the rest of the world is almost out of touch with, whether that be the extent of honor killings or the kind of police brutality. Like mm. we had all of these protests in the US. We were in college when they were happening for George Floyd and all of these other victims. Yet we sometimes forget the extent of that back here in our own country just because we're unaware. And so I think part of that was wanting to bring light to these stories that are so rooted in our collective psyche, mm. yet we're sort of unaware of those because there is no podcast. There there is no popular medium that conveys them properly. Enough. Yeah, it's super interesting because there's yeah. cultural context when yeah, you speak true. about uh, South Asia. I mean, yeah. and yeah. if you go zoom in even further into the Indian context, yeah. uh, uh, crimes that in the West would be making headlines over here sometimes just go unnoticed yeah. uh, because just because of the volume of crimes that happen in that genre or just by the default setting of 
this is our population yeah, and absolutely. by and large this yeah. really doesn't matter right um is there any particular conclusion i wouldn't say conclusion because it's too early in the day i i expect this to have a uh, years worth of research and collective conversation but is there any particular trend that you see in the psyche of crimes that happen in india i'll preface this with a disclaimer that we aren't psychologists or qualified to comment on psychology in any way these are opinions of a 22 year old in case a clip of this is made and circulated around but i have noticed uh, two trends in covering crime for 3 plus years now one having lived in america um i would say psychopathy in america many cases like the ted bundys of the world right mm. are way too common where the 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 killings are almost inexplicable these serial killers that pop up whereas in india it's usually led um now whether it's on a killings mm. which are rampant across south asia right pakistan has one of the is has the highest per capita on a killing i mean i don't know the statistic so they're so led that you can't just pinpoint it to oh he's a psychopath he's a serial killer or she's a serial killer so that's a trend in india um that i've noticed Yeah I I think I agree with Aryan there and my observation has been in line with that which there's this quote I really like which is we're all victims of victims and I'm not trying to excuse the behavior of any of the criminals that we cover that exist out in society it's really really tragic that we have the problems that we do yet it takes really diving deep into the mm. back stories of the criminals that we cover to realize we're legitimately all victims of victims behind the man that chopped up his wife and put her in a fridge is a closeted gay man who society never gave the permission to be himself mm. behind the rapist is a young 7 year old sexually assaulted by an uncle whose story never got out there it's poor people without a day worth of education it's children hit it's children left out to fend for themselves in this society i think again not to excuse anything but the trend is that that there is so much more depth like aryan said mm. to these stories and it requires so much more digging in we're certainly not qualified to do it um but it really requires some digging in and some thorough um i guess reflection on our part as a society to fix this problem i think forward. at least contrasted with how india and the pop culture had been covering mm. true crime which is yeah dance and dekhe you know that kind <laughs> of uh, sensationalizing yeah. of these cases yeah. which made good and evil black and white right mm. this is the good this is the evil hate on the person that committed the crime and you know to what ashwara said explanation is not justification right and we do this in our lives all the time right when we explain our bad behaviors but those aren't justifications but you explain them because you think there was a rational behind you doing yeah. it um and i think in society if we don't figure out the right cause behind the problem you won't be addressing the right the root issue and so when people tend to villainize criminals as ashwara is saying i mean sure do that right we want justice for the victims but in vin- villainizing the criminal you are not getting to the underpinning the problem yeah. solving which could actually lead to some mm. solutions in society mm. so yeah i think i'd agree with that point yeah so let's come to specifics um why don't you all tell me a story a mystery or um a crime that you that has been solved that you guys have discussed that you think our viewers would be interested to know it can be either solved or unsolved let's yeah. let's go as if you would be actually talking on your story. podcast mm. so if you have to tell me just exactly the way you would so that's the idea of mm-hmm. this segment okay. uh mm-hmm. don't need a brief don't need a you can go into as much detail as possible so i wanted to wanted to give people a real flavor of mm. what it is like to discuss so i think one of our favorite episodes that we've ever done was um something it was a case based on an irish journalist jonathan spolan mm. now you know uh, if you've ever traveled across the world and been in very unique circumstances specific to a culture they tend to be you know overstimulating and overpowering uh think of being in a hot air balloon in turkey or uh, doing a scuba diving in thailand right mm. these are you you are completely amazed by that experience i think what india has to offer as a parallel experience is being in india itself mm. it's so overpowering to be in this country mm. because especially to an outsider or a foreigner as we say because they're not used to these stimulants the stimulants of smell sound 
and one of the stimulants being the religious experience of being in India. Mm-hmm. If you go to a Haridwar, for example, or you go to a Varanasi, you have never seen spirituality weaved into the fabric of that particular city. And so that particular overstimulation uh, from the religious offerings of India um, leads many foreigners who come to our country to be bamboozled. Um, and being bamboozled is part of travel, right? That's why we travel to be completely lost in the place we are in. But this specific bamboozling by the spiritual offerings of India leads to some crazy outcomes. Mm-hmm. Now, these crazy outcomes were coined the India syndrome, as coined by a French psychologist. He worked at the French consulate in Mumbai itself um, a few decades ago. So while he was posted there and each consulate has their own medical team, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the cons, you know, when foreigners come to India, they prefer to go to their consulate instead of the public hospital. You yeah, can imagine obviously. why, right? Um, and instead of getting, you know, injured people at the consulate or people who had, you know, panic attacks or needed medication or something like this, this particular friend psychologist, the majority of cases that he was facing while uh, serving in Bombay was people, French citizens coming to him reporting panic attacks, the feeling of being lost, um, complete confusion, um, and, you know, they were delusional. Now, you could say they were schizophrenic or they were delusional, but when he dug into it, they had no family history. They had no personal history of any of these um, issues, but they were all reporting the same symptoms that he couldn't quite peg to a pre-established mental health issue and so he called it the India syndrome and he said this happens when these white people who have no cultural context of um, you know the spiritual beliefs that are so central to India come here and are suddenly taken away with it and they just they lose all senses they're overstimulated Mm -hmm. they get the India syndrome so he coined this term now one prime example of this is our Irish journalist Jonathan Spolin uh, Spolin's been a journalist for a while now. We are in the 2000s, I think. And uh, he's worked in Hong Kong. And as most people now in India complain, he felt burnt out. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the corporate gig and the journalistic hustle just had him tired. And um, as we do quite often now, when we feel burnt out, we go to Buddhism or meditation or this and that, right? Um, white people have been doing this forever. Um, they love their spirituality. And so he realized he can't have more of the daily hustle of life and he will quit it all. He will take a break, come to India, rejuvenate, um, and then see where life takes him. And when was this? So now the year is 2012. And Spolin tells his family that, hey, listen, I'm going to India for a while. I need a break from this life. Um, And it was a very well-planned, like, people knew that he was coming to India. It wasn't like um, he was running away from his family or anything. And he was in constant constant contact with his mom. And so he comes to India um, and he spends a week here. He spends two weeks here. And his trip keeps getting extended. And he tells his mom, I just want to spend some more time here. How and long was he originally state, slated? I, I, that's, I don't think that's, that's out there. That's yeah. out there. But he, he kept saying, extending. He kept, he kept extending it. And um, so it was 3rd February 2012, a few weeks after he'd been in India. Um, he had a conversation with his mom on the phone in which his mom recollects him saying, quote, I want to do it on my own. Kind of a spiritual thing, end quote. Um, talking about just being here in India, I just, w- just want to do a spiritual thing, right? And young people tend to be like this even nowadays. About 35 minutes after um, this conversation ensued with his mother, she texted him the following thing. Have a wonderful experience and don't w- worry as we are 100% behind you. So go for it. Love you so much. Send me an I'm okay text as often as possible. Some might get through. She never got an I'm okay text after that day. Because she never got any text from Spolin after that day. Weeks went by. 
and initially the parents were like all right my kid is doing his own spiritual thing um but you know weeks turned to several weeks and um, he was uncontactable and they knew something was definitely wrong and this was not the day and age of you know instagram and social media being as a uh, pervasive in society as it's now not in india of course by any stretch of the imagination so it was very tough for this family in ireland trying to figure out where their son is and there is in fact this portal for missing foreigners in india do you remember yes. the, you know the many of these disappearances mm-hmm. happen as i said because of the india syndrome um and many of these cases of you know white people just going uh, crazy uh, when they find themselves in this beautiful culture of ours and uh and so she posted on that site saying my son Jonathan Spolen is not contactable give any leads please help us out um and finally they got in touch with the police as well the indian police and now an investigation was um initiated and you know police tried to look for white guy long hair they had the images but none by the match you know um, of spolen's pictures was found so the mother provided his last location which was somewhere around rishikesh is what mm-hmm. he told them where the trek would be um and so after a few days of investigating uh, the first sign of spolen was found and you know you think that receiving a sign is a good thing the parents would be excited or you know you finally There's something some indication. about my son's whereabouts yeah. um and the sign was good but it was probably the eeriest evidence that i think we've come across on the podcast before because it wasn't gory it was on a trekking trail by the hillside near the lakshman bridge in rishikesh if yeah. any of you have been there um around the trekking uh, trail in neatly folded piles were his clothes and the shoes kept there and to me there is just something so unnerving i would rather his clothes be all over the place yeah but something about them being neatly tied just doesn't sit right with me and um then sit right the investigators let alone the parents and now they knew that th- those were spolen's clothes right the parents uh, certified that but nothing else was found his, not his body alive or dead um and since that day the stories are all stories he is still never been found um since 2012 so decade plus decade plus at this point right and um yeah no dead body no, not him alive and of course you know 2012 and a few years after that the parents really tried their best to find him yeah, right they're putting out posters that came to india um you know and the, there's activity on the portal where you look for white people um and um no he was he was never found until a few years later they got an anonymous tip that i saw your son on a bus in south india something like that you know i spotted spolen like random yeah 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 randomly somebody hmm. told reached out to the parents and told them about that again that was just you know a trail uh, it was here say it was i mean it was either somebody playing with the victim's parents you know emotions or them truly believing that was polen like you can misconstrue it you yeah, can think yeah, you saw somebody but yeah, it was somebody else yeah. yeah and i mean white people joke how we look similar i think we can joke <laughs> about how they all look similar so i wouldn't be surprised somebody from an indian village going oh hmm. that's polen but um he's never been found since and many speculate I mean there are conspiracy theories which we can dive into some are he just fell off the cliff into the water while mm. trekking which does not explain neatly, neatly folded yeah. clothes like if you just fell yeah, yeah. um you don't want to take off your clothes yeah. whilst falling exactly. the activity yeah, exactly. yeah. like if an animal attacked you yeah. he wouldn't awesome. be like oh let me fold yeah. this guy yeah so, yeah the other is he was so dead set on relinquishing anything from his past corporate is you know materialistic life that he just wanted to leave it off you know have a clean break Kim, this is a bit of an extended clean and, break yeah, it's, it's a it's a, it's as clean yeah. as clean breaks <laughs> yeah, come yeah, yeah um but he just gave it all up and now he's 
some sant white sant baba in india somewhere uh, somewhere hopefully yeah and his parents have given up uh, yeah, i think that yeah i mean when do parents really give, give up, up but yeah but like sense. i mean they've lived without him for about yes. 12 years now hmm. mm-hmm. very interesting um so when you come across cases like this right where there's so much context uh, in terms of okay there's also a theory that is the india syndrome which is something i've heard for the first time mm-hmm. and then there's this missing person and uh, he's still not found mm. do parts of you want to kind of figure it out i mean do you re- do you want to be those people like we solve this highly unsolvable case of this missing person for 11 plus years and we're the ones who did it Absolutely and I don't think those things have to necessarily go hand in hand I don't think to be a crime podcaster one wants to have to mm-hmm. solve them as well Yeah um but I think just having covered enough of them there are some that just I don't know what it is that some just stick out and stick in your brain for the longest time uh, Jonathan Spolin is one of those for me there is another one it's the disappearance of Sneha Philip in New York she just vanished on the day of 9/11 and was never seen after that um many many years later there was there's an online postcard community where someone sent in a postcard which said um everyone i know thinks i died in 9/11 and it had the twin towers burning on that picture so it absolutely like bonkers case to me i wish i had the expertise the skills necessary to do them maybe one day i will but there's a part of me that absolutely wants, wants to do it yeah, yeah. So we've spoken about the Indian context in terms of the India syndrome yeah. which is relevant to the west. Um let's talk about a particular case um in India that is solved isn't solved something which is up your alley that you'd like to tell our audience. So this is one of the most gut-wrenching terrifying cases I've ever covered read off discussed and it's the murder technically the suicide but i would call the murder of 14 year old ruchika gerotra she died in 1993 and she was found in her house it was obvious plain as day that it was a suicide uh, there was an insecticide bottle next to her dead body the insecticide was it was the same one that was found in her liver in her spleen in her blood uh, that was determined to be the cause of death there was no forced entry no marks of a struggle no footprints absolutely nothing to indicate otherwise Um yet if anybody knew Ruchika's life and what she'd been going through for the last few years I think everybody would be justified in saying that there was nothing suicidal about this child and there was nothing about this case that would deem it fit to be called a suicide other than the biological mechanisms of how she died and so the story goes back to when she's a 12 13 year old girl she's an avid tennis player and her dreams and hopes are to make it big as a tennis player and represent her country nationally internationally uh, and she's a member of the haryana and a player of the haryana lawn tennis association the head of which is this man named shambhu pratap singh rathore who's also the haryana uh, inspector of police and he takes notice of this young girl who comes and plays in his lawn tennis association um every week and of course this is a grown man with a daughter the age of ruchika his daughter was a student with ruchika in her same school same class and oh, same like confirm yeah confirmed. okay yeah. yeah absolutely and um something about this young girl strikes is very interesting to this man he goes over to her house to speak with her father ruchika's mother had previously passed he's speaking to her father highly about her tennis capabilities and talking about how he wants to fund her tennis um for the training and he wants her to make it big and so he invites her over to play tennis in his really fancy tennis that court that he has in the backyard of his home and his home is on the lawn tennis association compound and he calls her to come and play and he wants to kind of uh, sit and see in on her capabilities and see what they can do next about her training and so ruchika goes she's playing he calls her after her game into his office where he inappropriately touches her uh he gropes her ruchika's friend who was playing with her that afternoon walks in on them and asks him to let her go and in that frenzy of being caught he leaves ruchika and the two girls run out of of his office and they run back home the friend is not his daughter no the friend is not his daughter okay. this is another tennis player friend of yeah. ruchika's who she was playing with that day um this was all that mm. the incident was all that the incident was and from here began a saga of torture and mental harassment that is so insane to me it's just incomprehensible it's 
it's the story of how the young girl who that day was playing with Ruchika ended up getting married two decades later and still getting harassing calls from Shambhu Pratap Singh Rathore and his perpetrators when she was married in her late 20s she had to move to Australia finally to get rid of the calls she was getting all in an attempt to cover up all in an attempt to just keep these girls to be quiet um this was a case of Ruchika's father losing his government job uh losing any kind of pension any kind of monetary assistance he would have otherwise received this is a case of um i think 12 or 15 criminal cases filed against ruchika's younger brother which if ruchika was 14 her younger brother was what 10 maybe mm. one of which was a murder case um this is the story of ruchika's brother being taken in by police officers to a police building where they took wooden rollers on this child's knees and stepped stood on the wooden rollers on each side while this kid cried when this kid came back home finally was let out of this police station um ruchika had already killed herself wanting her brother to be left free wanting her father to be left free this is a case i've cried every single time i've discussed it this It's was all in an attempt to keep keep the them quiet, quiet for that one incident where he tried to grope her he tried to assault her but these girls ran away um so but this incident came to light how this came to light primarily from actually it's really heartwarming from the efforts of ruchika's friend the one who was there that day and her parents they've never let it go they've continued to fight for it they found old documents up until recently like 5 or 6 years ago and continued to file petitions ruchika's father unfortunately moved out of the city that they were living in he took some small job of picking up dirt and moving it from one location to another he was in a bank prestigious position previously that was the only thing he would get after that he took it to sustain himself and his son so i think they had pretty much kind of reconciled their fate but it was ruchika's friend and her parents who continued to um have the means necessary to be able to fight for justice because to be able to fight for justice is a privilege and they took that away from ruchika's father um so yeah i just yeah that's really sad but yeah. but he was finally apprehended he was and he was given a very good punishment of being in jail for 30 minutes 30 minutes yeah that's it was really really not not in jail for justice. 30 minutes and that's just he was stabbed on the way out which I, yeah. i call that a some, way some some <laughs> bystander just and um you know you mentioned that there was torture to her from this incident till the time she unfortunately tragically committed yeah. suicide Um talk to me a little bit about that like what was what was going on in that period Um yeah so like i mentioned Ruchika's brother was was unique This is before before she harassed Yeah this is before she committed suicide This is before she committed suicide yeah even before she committed suicide they came into her home dressed in plain clothes it was all police officers dressed in plain clothes ransacked her home um stripped her brother down naked and took him around circles in their colony something to that effect um there were there were incidents like uh, they hired protesters to stand outside of Rushika's house in an attempt to scare her and intimidate her to not file a complaint um there were there were countless incidents like that there were police cases against Rushika any news reporter in the city who would come out and cover this case trying to defend the family and trying to write in their favor had criminal cases of defamation god knows what all slapped against them i don't think anyone ever expected to win these whoever was slapping these cases but i think the intention was just to complicate things so much and scare everyone and intimidate it's intimidation. so yeah. much yeah it's straight up intimidation um the same thing happened to Rushika's father with the amount of cases against him against Rushika's lawyers there was that um there was there was intimidation of the judge i don't fully remember anymore but the judge was actually involved in some kind of a conflict of interest with ruchika's father and so it it didn't make any sense that he was the judge put on this case but this was a judge who would have blatantly been unfair to judge this case hmm. um the perpetrator continued to continue to delay proceedings when he was finally brought 
to justice and when the court case finally began he would have weird demands like he wanted cameras in the courtroom and then he would retract those demands and so he would just prolong the process so much where this girl didn't get justice for god knows how many years after she died and when she did get it it was for 30 minutes and this man ended up receiving like medals for his work in the police he ended up being promoted multiple times by the haryana state government in when i covered this episode i made sure to name all of the political parties people need to know who they vote for um and what the back stories of all of these what goes on in these states is um it's really really one yeah. of the few episodes where at the end of it i was crying like a baby yeah you know, completely yeah completely yeah. shaken apart and like i said like i go into these stories not knowing the story at all and so this caught me so off guard and you know i was crying on the mic and i told her let's just keep this in because this is my honest response to what you've just told me this yeah. harrowing story um of injustice yeah uh, and on many levels many many to levels, many yeah. many many different fact, people you know i mean this is again there's so many tangents and you know check out the desi crime podcast we have the full story but um this reached this point where it reached like an atul bihari vajpay um yeah. who sort of um it reached to that level to get this man out of trouble this guy who started off as the yeah uh, whatever post he started on so it's a very convoluted story and uh, at the very least it's important that somebody tells them in a non uh yeah they care style um so the objective viewer or the objective listener can um have the facts presented to themselves as what they are instead of in these sensationalized voices um yeah you know i i another case which is a very different flavor from this case um it's a personal favorite of mine and it has no political undergirding so um, you know you can listen to it without feeling particular uh, jitters know, jitters or uh, <laughs> you know feeling offended that your party is being talked about in a negative way but for this we go to kolkata mm-hmm. um and one of my favorite cases and favorite is not the right word but favorite case. one of my um, yeah. most what is the word interesting 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 yeah uh, yeah it's an interesting case so we are on robinson street kolkata um late 2000s um or early 2010s so somewhere around that range um and robinson street in kolkata is i don't know what would be the mumbai corollary for that but it's a posh area it's no kolaba hmm. but it's like a posh it's area. upscale it's upscale yeah. um and um, you know the political you know the, the polit- politicians live there and um, so you know things don't go awry here you know they everything is in order and so when there is smoke visible from one of the houses on robinson street it stands out because everything else is so in order like if you were in any random part of delhi smoke is like uh, a rea smoke bar there but um, you know here it was out of the ordinary and so immediately the cops were called and the firefighters were calling you're like oh there's a fire in some house um and you know there's a fire because the smoke is coming out of the tile to the bathroom window hmm. not a chimney hmm. uh, but it's just a smoke there's no blaze you know and there's no billowing smoke it's just a stream of smoke and so not taking this too seriously the cops and the firefighters show up to the house and at the door no um hey do you need help we can help you um but there was no response so they opened the door but the door was locked mm. and you know as they were about to break in because they're trying to save whoever's inside they hear a voice but this is not a decipherable voice it's just they're hearing uh, hums like when you're in a classroom and that distracting kid is humming in the background mm. just singing some song yeah yeah you know that's what they're hearing from the inside as they have their ears um close to the door and that unnerves them like what the fuck is in there yeah um and so they break open and as soon as they break open the sound that sound increases and they realize it's not just one sound those are many many sounds of a hum of a certain religious hymn playing Mm. and the uh, it smells horrible in this house and it's dark as hell and of course when you you know religious hymns in this setting just feel like you're entering a horror house right mm. um and the cops that entered that house thinking they're going to save somebody from a fire did not expect to see what they were about to see 
they tried to get to the source of the smoke, which was from the bathroom, as I said. So when they opened the bathroom door, in the bathtub was a half-burned corpse of a man. Uh, and it took a second for them to realize this man had committed suicide. There was a gasoline uh, bottle or jar on the side with a note. The note said, uh, love you, beta. And the cops are completely bad. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what, how do you say that in Bengali, but they roughly said kya ho in Bengali, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And uh, right, there were more rooms in this house and now they know this is no small fire. They have a proper investigation at hand. And so the room adjacent to the bathroom, they try knocking that again, no response. So they try to open it. But it's tough to open it because you know, there is a little space between the door and yeah, the floor, yeah. right? For ventilation and, you know, not for the door to scratch the surface. That's stuffed with cloth. Now, my mum did this, you know, when we, when, you know, middle class family did, did some machar don't come into the house, you know? Mm. So you stuff the uh, gap between the door. But, you know, they weren't protecting any machar. What the hell is up? So they finally managed to uh, shimmy the door open. And it's pitch black. It's the darkest possible room there is. There's no like iota of light seeping through. And so it took some times for their pupils to adjust and for their, them to realize what's in. And they finally got their flashlights out. And I don't think I've come across a more scary setup um, in the genre of nonfiction in whatever I've read. Um, it starts off very nice where it's a bed that is well made um, and in it is somebody sleeping uh, with pillows tucked and it's like a nice hotel room that you walk into like it's very well maintained and it's clean and as they walk closer to the bed that person they think is sleeping is actually a skeleton with a ribbon tied across the neck um, with the skeletons of two dogs on the bed with ribbon style on it as well. That is so random. And everything else is in place, it's full order. You know, like the skeleton is tucked in the bed sheet. The cops You couldn't you couldn't write this shit. Yeah. You know? And then they hear a sound, you know. Apart from the hymns, which are still playing, and these are religious Christian hymns that are playing. Um, they hear the sound of her hmm. coming from the living room. And as they walk there, they see a man with white hair named Partho Day banging his head on the living room wall. The news goes out and it is you don't need to sensationalize this case for it to be sensational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, pretty, there's no need for extra drama. There is no drama. need for yeah. any uh, exaggeration. And it makes waves across Kolkata, West Bengal, and then eventually the entirety of India in that um, you know brief time was completely absorbed into this case. How long ago was this? I think it was 2012, around that time. Okay. And 2012 seems like a wild era. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. world was supposed to end as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, the world was. Yeah. Or yeah. I'm getting the year wrong, and you know, fixing with an asterisk on the story. Yeah. It's, it's been a while since I've covered this. So now, Krishma, if you were the investigator, and these are the facts hmm. at your disposal, hmm. what would you think happened? I don't know. I'm just so. If you, if you major yeah, guess. Yeah. Okay. You know? Fine. Okay. If I had to guess, it was some kind of a sacrifice going on. Hmm. And, and you're assuming what, what what do you think Partho Day's role in this would be? This, like the the organizer of the ritual. The organizer. Yeah, like you know, like let me organize Burari this ritual. Yeah, organized. like like I'll yeah, but I mean in that case everybody, everybody died. died. Yeah. Um, that's almost what I thought it was because in my research I was reading it chronologically. Me like, too. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, this Partho this Partho Day, Day yeah. is the craziest man there is, and in my head. And I try to think of myself as a nuanced writer who's able to discern, you know, criminal. We were talking about this big, mm. right? Not every, you know, humanize the criminal also in order to understand the story. 
I wasn't able to humanize Parth Patel. I was like, this dude's bad shit crazy. Yeah. So my opinion is shared by the investigators and everybody who are at the scene, and he's immediately sent to prison. Um, but this man is completely delusional. Um, uh, but clearly, he was found banging his head in a house where a skeleton has been there. I mean, it takes time for a body to decompose to the point there is no musculature, no tissue, nothing left. And you can't so, you can't breathe in that environment. You it's can't that, breathe there. I mean, it's horrid, right? Yeah. So he's definitely been living with a skeleton. And it takes time for the body to decompose. So you can only wager a guess for how many And the two months. dogs. The two dogs, yeah. So it takes time for dog bodies to also decompose, much like human bodies. So he's been there forever. This this is from the get-go, somebody or something's wrong. And he doesn't talk when taken into the At custody. all. Yeah. And not because I not because I, I don't know what the reason was, but I don't think he was capable of talking in the state that they found him. He was just delusional. Um, and eventually the uh, psychologists in the psychiatric association I think made a plea to the uh, justice department and the police that transfer this guy over to us it was a mental asylum let us first see what's up before you you know prod him with your questions he's already somebody who needs help mm -hmm. and finally after a, you know a, a few days back and forth he was finally sent to the mental asylum where he got the care that was required for somebody in the state that he was from. And slowly he opened up. And slowly the story of what happened in that house on Robinson Street came out. And it's a story, again, you couldn't write this if you wanted to. Um, the skeleton belonged to Partho's sister. Um, and the burnt body was of his father. Um, his father had committed suicide as uh, was apparent but what happened to the sister and what about their mother their mother never came in the picture so you know long story short this was a family of four uh, lived in Kolkata their whole life and it was a family that started off a little on the edge from the get-go so the mother what does it mean little on the edge uh, this family was a little weird. Okay. From the get go. Okay. Not this weird, but weird. Yeah. And like there's something, there's something, something off. off. Yeah. Something off. Um, and we find out that there is a diary Partho has maintained. And I've, I've read several of the diary entries Partho wrote that the investigators found. Um, and these document his relationship with his mother. So this is one of the first signs of what's weird about this family, right? Um, it's not skeleton weird right now, but it's weird. In the diaries, Partho talks about um, how he almost had an incestuous relationship with his mother. Incestuous more in the sort of in the, the tension between the two. It never actually led to anything physical. It didn't manifest. Yeah, but his mother always nagged him about being with women. Um, and almost when, you know, tried to make him have sex with the maid once at their house and insinuated things, you know. Um, and this is again Partho's recollection of... Um, this was not mother. actual diary entries? This actual is his... diaries. Okay, these are actual diary, diary entries. Actual diaries from when he was younger. And these were found? These were found. And so the, the weird dynamic between the uh, mother and son and then the sister uh, didn't have a healthy relationship with the mother because, you know, the mother always felt that uh, the sister is snatching Partho away from her, you know. Um, now, usually that is a dynamic shared between the Bahu, right, where the Sasuma thinks the Bahu is sort of, you know, taking my son away. But the mother here had that sort of um, inclination towards her own daughter. Um, so now, this went for a while and Partho grew up um, an effeminate boy because he was never allowed to hang out with other boys, let alone people in general. He was kept in, even the sister, they weren't allowed to meet people. Um, the mother tried to protect them from the world outside. And so they, these grew up really caged kids without social skills. So they're off, they're weird. But you know, we've all met weird and off people who are you know, creative people tend to be yeah. weird. You know, so 
that's fine mm. that's okay mm. but when after a few years go by um parthos grandfather dies mm. and this really messes with uh, parthos mom's head and the family dynamics sort of skews after the death and this is the late uh 90s i think mm. uh, when the grandfather passed away correct me on the dates uh, i might be wrong but that's when it goes from weird to bad shit crazy the family dynamic breaks down um the mother starts a fast a fast that lasted around 5 6 months until she died and the fast was so she can connect with um the deceased relative and as a way of uh, salvation um so she she didn't eat for 5 6 eat. months okay 5 months she died okay and this is part who is telling there is no proof to uh, certify this uh, we know she was dead once the mom died it so before the mom died weird to bad shit crazy once the mom died from bad shit crazy to whatever superlative adjective there exists for crazy i don't mm. even know what that is mm. but that's when it it completely went bonkers this family stopped talking to each other they lived in the same house they didn't talk verbally talk they used to write notes to each other for months for years they communicated via notes that were found all around the house that was their form of communication with each other um they barely stepped out obviously um you know, sometimes maybe the sister stepped out to get food but she left her job as a music teacher and now the daughter replicated her mother's path of salvation through fasting and so the she probably fasted for i think 5 or 6 months as well until she perished and um, all that was left was, was his skeleton and parthu loved his sister loved her to death she was his, she was uh, his confidant right um in you know contrast to the mother he had that he didn't really like had a weird relationship with so he was taken aback by the death of his sister that's why the skeleton was neatly tucked because he wanted to take he refused to believe that his sister had died so he used to take care of her he used to feed the skeleton food when the dogs died he kept the dogs there to provide his you know sister company so this was a delusional man child who just loved his sister and um, you know had just he gone insane frankly um and it, he it's reported and it's so tough for me to believe but the dad didn't find out about the dead sister for 6 months after her death um i don't know what kind of family this is right but that that's what uh, the final investigation revealed and when the father did find out that the sister is dead he killed himself um and told partho love you beta um and then partho was found in the state that he was found in um so the final investigation revealed that contrary to what both the first and what the investigator investigators believed on at the outset that he's involved he was completely you know he was just a really 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 broken person who'd been in a very traumatizing circumstance and then he was kept um, he was cleared of all charges he was kept in a mental asylum he was treated um, for very long and uh, then one of the fathers from the church um, took him into the church and uh, tried to make him a part of society again and so years later there was this video of a school function parth organized uh for kids where uh, he sings a song as well and this is a very broken man that's trying to fix himself right that everybody's working towards and parth was getting better um uh, he joined facebook and used to make positive messages again he, he was still weird so you know a kid who's not had a normal childhood yeah. but he was acclimatizing to society more and more um until one fine day uh, much like his father he was found dead in a bathroom in a in his apartment in kolkata years later it's tragic yeah so sad 
It's so sad. Wow. And what you would perceive and what it actually was. I felt so bad for the person yeah. I was vilifying at the start, start of the research. Yeah. 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 No, this Absolutely. is a story of really disliking Partho. Kind of really, really rooting for him to fix his life and to get back out there and then just feeling hard. Not broken. broken. He dies, yeah. Yeah. That's refreshing that, you know, you guys are speaking about these cases in this kind of um, communication format. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that as we close the episode. Uh, you guys are on Spotify and you'll do audio just out of curiosity. Why not audio visual? Um, so I think it was just like we mentioned in the beginning, we just stumbled upon a lack in the market in the audio form. And so began in the audio form. Um, our, I think, unique expertise was in oration, which also kind of pushed us to the audio format. I had never at all conceived the idea of being in front of a camera, or really <laughs> speaking to one. Also, um, just count how many people are there here. One, two, three, four, five. The, the level of production required for video. Yeah. You can use you our a, studio. You have a mic here with two mics. Yeah. And, yeah, so. Initially, when we were students in dorm rooms, it just production. But wise. you could not, yeah. Other, yeah and whereas podcasting is one laptop, two mm. mics. It was so easy. We used to travel with our mics wherever we that's, went. Yeah, really that's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. that was the initial rationale. Yeah. Now we are getting into audio visual. By the time I think this episode comes out, yeah, you will see us on YouTube. 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 Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fantastic. And you'll have 150,000 subscribers. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what do you all want to do from here? I think just a lot more of this, a lot of diversification of. So this is going to be your genre. career. Is this is that what is that what it is, or um, is that something that we're still exploring as something that we do, but we will have. I think still exploring. I love okay. doing this, and I'd be perfectly content doing this for yeah. a very very long time. Yeah. But there's so much more that I want, and I don't think that means I want to stop doing this. Mm. It just means I want to continue to grow and add yeah. more things that we do. And the same holds true for for the work that we do now within the ambit of crime and true crime and horror and suspense we want to produce more and yeah. more different kinds of shows yeah and it's more and more content. fascinating yeah, we've yeah. started a production house called desi studios hmm. uh, and we're creating several ips uh, one is desi crime the other is uh, i don't know if this will be out by the time the episode comes out called booth busters hmm. where we're going to haunt ghostbusters desi, but like desi, desi. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they're all about that desi um and yeah creating these ips i think uh I think these stories told, I, I think India is just, there are so many stories to tell here. Yeah. Um, we're, we're a land of fables and myths fables, and yeah. You know, yeah. India syndrome can, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a There's a context. Yeah, there's, there's a reason. There's a context. Yeah. And there are so many stories to tell. And I think, you know, people, you know, as creators or as entrepreneurs, you're trying to look for the next big thing that, that mm. it's about to come, the next technology, the next genre. You keep, you know, that's anybody's guess. You, you, nobody can guess what's about to change, what's the new thing. But you can definitely look back at what hasn't changed. Like Warren Buffett did this, right? Yeah. Warren Buffett did, uh, he, he once said the story of Warren Buffett going, him asking somebody, what was the top selling chocolate bar mm. in 1960s? Mm. Um, the person didn't know, he said, Snickers. What was the best selling chocolate in America now? Still Snickers. So there are some things that never change. And I think storytelling and certain genres like true crime and horror, people love them. They, these have been part of our collective psyche yeah. for so long. And India has so many of these stories, you know, across all genres that need to be told well, you know. Yeah. It, it, it's not only good enough to tell a good story. It's important to tell a good story well. Correct. And I think as creators, you know, I, I that's what I want to do. I want to find these. I like I said, I don't like true crime, but I love <laughs> telling the story of, and of, writing it in yeah. a good way. Um, so it interests you and it interests the people who listen to us. And I, I think we'd like to do more Absolutely. of that. Absolutely, yeah, lots more of that. Amazing. Good luck, guys. Thank this has you. been a very fascinating episode. I think uh, another one from the Humans of Bombay show that comes close is one we did with Paranormal Activity. Mm. Mm. Um, you should check that out because uh, I think that it's up your alley. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you guys for taking the time. Perfect. And Thank I you. wish you a lot of luck because I actually love what you guys do. I think that it's important and it's necessary. That so thanks. Well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being the best community and we'll see you in the next one.